Hey everyone, welcome to Draw My PhD. So I'm doing a PhD in Computational Material Science. Uh, my work kind of sits, so if you've got chemistry here, and physics here, it's probably, probably sort of about there. Most of what I do is physics. My undergrad degree was in physics, um, but I have to learn quite a lot of chemistry to understand this. So what I'm doing is researching materials for the third generation of solar cells. The first being your sort of standard inorganic, what are called silicon solar cells, what the majority of you I imagine are used to, which is kind of like, say you have your house, it's these big panels you find on rooftops, they're quite big, quite clunky, very efficient, they work well, they last a very long time, but they're very expensive. In manufacturing you have to heat them up to about a thousand degrees Celsius generally. So they're very expensive, transporting them is expensive, etc. So these are our inorganic type of solar cells. The second generation is generally your organic type of solar cell. So these might be sort of flexible, they'll be like carbon based materials. They're much thinner, much easier to produce, much less expensive, but they're nowhere near as efficient and they don't really last as long. So the material that I'm working on is a hybrid of these two materials. So it's a hybrid inorganic organic material um, called a perovskite solar cell. So this material is any crystal which takes the form A, B, X, free. And I'll describe what that means in a sec. So if you have one set of atoms that make up your material, so if you zoom right in to what's called a unit cell, you get what's kind of essentially a cube of atoms just sitting near each other. See if I can draw a cube. All right, it's a bit rectangular, but there we go. So with this material, we have an A on each corner. So each one of these is our A material. We have our B in the center. And we also have our X on each face. And this is sort of often visualized with a little like octahedra, if I can draw it. Oh dear, yeah, so you sort of have this little like octahedra. Um, so in one of these cubes, you have one A atom, because only an eighth of each of these is inside this cube. You have one B in the middle, and then three X's, because there are six of them and half is in each. So this is our material, and what's interesting about our material, in our case, is A is an inorganic molecule. And in the case that I most often research, it's called methylammonium. So we normally call it MA. Then our B and our X are inorganic materials. Again, like our silicon from before, in our case, most of the time, lead and some kind of halide, but generally iodine. Doesn't really matter too much. But the important bit is this bit's organic, each corner, and we have this sort of inorganic octahedra in the middle. So it means that our material can exhibit both the effects of inorganic, very strong material, which lasts a very long time, but also the cheap processing of organic. The interesting thing here is that this whole crystal structure can be made in a lab by simply pouring different materials on top of each other, spinning it until it dries, and then you're left with several layers of your solar cell. Um, so we have a very cheap alternative. Um, the efficiency of this perovskite solar cell is already sort of matching the inorganic, nearly. It's very close. Um, and we're sort of beating organic lifetimes, but there's still a bit of a gap to be bridged. It's not quite long-lasting enough. 
these proscites are also quite susceptible to water, to oxygen, this kind of thing. So it means that actually getting them out there is quite difficult. Um, but if they do so, you'd be able to make solar cells that are as efficient as inorganic for about the same price as organic solar cells. So there'd be a lot of potential for, say, much uh, poorer countries to be able to have solar cells because the cost of manufacturing and delivery, importantly, in that case, would be very low. Um, and as a lot of the poorer countries in the world are the ones with the most sunlight, it's quite an important region, I think. So the lab work in making these perovskites has become quite advanced. Um, it's only been in the 10 years, the past 10 years that these have even been talked about. And in the past five years, there's been real progress. So these are very good, but they do need some refining. So the region that I work in, which I vaguely mentioned before, is computational work. So the experimental work's very good, but they're still, some theoretical um, holes left. So the technique that I use is something called density functional theory. So it's normally called DFT. So in DFT, we're uh, making an approximation on an even scarier equation called the many body Schrodinger equation, which sounds scary, but it's really not. How it looks on paper in its proper form is H with a little hat, size, Greek letter, equals E, psi, which won't mean much unless you um, have studied this before, but really all it means simply is that your kinetic energy plus your potential energy equals your total energy. So it's quite simple really. Um, so kinetic energy will kind of have um, your kinetic energy for each atom moving around. You can solve these quite easily, but what's more interesting is we want to solve the electron problems here. So for each electron in our material, we want to know roughly what its kinetic energy would be, and more difficult to find out is its potential energy generally. So um, this gets pretty complicated pretty quickly, as you can imagine, because if we just look at the potential energy for a bit, that potential energy is going to be dependent on how many other electrons are sitting nearby. Um, so this gets pretty complicated pretty quickly. So say we have, you know, two electrons near each other. This is pretty simple, right? Because this electron's potential just depends on this other one. It gets a bit more complicated when we introduce a third electron, etc. Um, but as we saw before, our material was methylammonium lead iodide. So our methylammonium has 19 electrons, our lead has 82 electrons, and our iodine, or our free iodine atoms combined, have 159 electrons. So that means total we have 260 electrons to deal with. So working out this potential for each one is very difficult. Um, if you're going to do a direct electron-electron interaction, like we've done here, it would be 4, 46,620 possible connections between them. So it's very, very expensive to calculate. So what we do here is we go back to the name of density functional theory. So instead of treating our electron system, say there's a lot more of them, blah, 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 becomes very expensive, lots of lines, etc. What we do instead of calculating every single one of these lines is we approximate a density field for this. So instead of explicitly treating every electron as a point, we sort of say, yeah, there's lots of electrons on this bit, and there's sort of a few over here, and you sort of get this general field. So instead of interacting every single electron electron, we just start interacting the field on each other. This means we can start to understand the electronic properties of our material very well, which is very important in a solar cell because you want to find out how much energy um, a sunlight, so say you have your solar cell, For example, you want to find out 
exactly how much energy you would need your photon to have, you normally give it this little symbol, um, to excite an electron. Because what we want to do in our material is a photon comes down, hits an electron, we call it exciting, which just means you give it enough energy to be free, go and conduct electricity, say it's free, you have a little circuit or whatever, I'm going to like load, and then this electron will be free and can move along and then make energy. So understanding the electronic properties is very important in this material. Something that I'm working quite a lot on at the moment um, with other people in my lab is looking at lead in particular because we don't really want lead in our material um, because we have a solution process material, we make it out of liquids. We don't really want lead floating around in liquid at any point near humans because it's extremely toxic. So we're kind of trying to shift this out with tin, which behaves the exact same way as lead. Um, it's in, in the same group in the periodic table, so it behaves very similarly. Um, but obviously you need to modify the material quite a bit for that to work. Now my problem just scratches the surface of a very large issue um, alone in solar energy harvesting, as well as climate change in general. Um, there's going to be many, many, many facets that are required to um, overturn climate change. And this is just one of them. And this is a very niche part of one of them. So hopefully my project, along with thousands of others throughout the world and thousands of other researchers, will slowly shift the tide from fossil fuels to renewable energy and start to make an impact on climate change.